Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for finding time to attend today's webinar about the new FFIEC IP examination handbook hosted by InfoSight. My name is Amanda Rago, and I'm the Senior Marketing Director at InfoSight, and I will be hosting this seminar with Vaughn Williams, who is InfoSight's Senior Security and PRC Assessor. During the seminar, you can submit all questions in the chat box, and we will review them at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will see a post post survey pop up, and your feedback is always greatly appreciated. Now I'll turn things over to Vaughn to review the agenda for today, a little about himself and info site, and then jump right into the presentation. Thanks, Amanda. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for the presentation. Uh, as you know, this handbook was released just a few short months ago, and very few people I know of have had much time to process everything that's contained within it. It's important to note that the opinions reflected in today's webinar are solely the opinion of me, the presenter. So in the words that so many auditors use, trust but verify. Always seek multiple opinions on things before you decide what opinion you are going to go with. With that being said, let's go over the things that we're going to cover today. We're going to go over a short review of the prior operations booklet, why the FFIEC created a new booklet, the definitions of AIO, what's in architecture, what's in infrastructure, and what's in operations. We'll actually cover the appendices as well, as there are some great nuggets in there that you'll surely want to take in. I'm going to try not to be too techy today, but if I fail and you do have a question, just remember that we'll conclude the seminar with a Q&A like Amanda mentioned. So please submit your questions using the Q&A function so that we can ensure that your question will be seen and that I'll have a chance to answer it. I know it's cliche, but it's also true. The only bad or silly question is the one that never gets asked. So why is InfoSight able to present this to you today? To answer that, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. As you can see on the slide, InfoSight was founded in 1998 and is headquartered in Miami, Florida. From the data center to the cloud, we architect, secure, and manage IT, OT, and ICS critical networks 24-7, 365. Our US-based SOC leverages a co-managed approach in defending your networks, keeping your system safe and secure. We also partner with multiple cloud providers, allowing us to manage and oversee your cloud implementation and security. Plus, if you're not there yet, we can help you migrate to the cloud too. We also provide security awareness training for all levels of employees up to and including the board of directors. As you know, it only takes one click on a link or attachment to potentially result in the breach of your company. And the last thing I'll mention here is that we offer a wide, a wide array of advisory and assessment services to help ensure that your company is adhering to regulatory and industry best practices to give you that peace of mind that you're doing it right, as well as providing you with the tools to help you improve your security posture. So if you are interested in learning more about any of our services, please visit us on the web using the URL you can see on the bottom right of the presentation. Our InfoSight team goes beyond the 26 character alphabet with all of the certifications we hold. A small portion of them are on the screen. Our team is full of members who thrive on learning and attaining new knowledge and certifications. You can rest easy knowing that you are working with subject matter experts on every project we are engaged with. So let me give you a little background on who I am and why I'm here today. As Amanda mentioned to you, and you can see on the screen, I'm the Senior Security and GRC Assessor with InfoSight. I have over 20 years of experience in IT, IT controls, and cybersecurity, with experience from the technology side through to the regulatory side. You can see some of the certs on screen that I hold, and my passion is helping businesses keep their systems and data secure. To keep up with all of the latest information I need to keep you safe, I attend a lot of webinars myself, read tons of security news, and research just about every new trick and tactic that threat actors like to use. I cringe walking through airports and retail outlets because of all the scary things and gaps I see in their IT environments. If you've attended one of my presentations before, bear with me while I tell you how I got started in this line of work. My passion for information security started, believe it or not, because of AOL and not because of their lack of security. The short story is my first online experience started with AOL, like many people, and creating a username. You might remember the old modem connecting noise, you've got mail. Well, every attempt at creating my own clever username resulted in, sorry, that name was taken. 
after an hour of trying to come up with a name on my own, I was getting a little frustrated. I might just be a little stubborn, just don't tell my wife I said that. So being frustrated, I banged on the keyboard, I will get in, hit enter, and I must have missed the I, and it said congratulations, will get in is available. And so the very next day in an AOL chat room, I was accused of being a hacker. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So that is how I got into security and I'm able to present to you today. So with that, let's jump on in and get started. Sometimes to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we came from. You might recognize the old adage, if you fail to remember the past, you will be doomed by the examiner on why it didn't improve. So let's do a quick review of the 2004 operations booklet. Let's hop in our DeLorean, take it to 88 miles an hour and visit 2004, the year that this booklet was created. It was the year when Windows XP started to roam the land and dominate its rivals, the time when flip phones and iPods competed with the computer for the attention of our teenage humanoid bipeds. Things were a lot easier in the IT world back then. The original operations booklet is what set the standard for guidance on providing risk controls uh, guidance in IT operations. The FFIEC expected entities to implement controls to mitigate IT-related risk. It set the standard for board of director and executive management oversight of IT operations and strategic planning. It covered operations management, including HR involvement, appropriate control environments, types of physical and logical access controls, and the fact that institutions needed outside expertise to meet business goals and objectives. In it, there were multiple tiers for risk management and risk identification covering hardware inventories, software inventories, network topologies, data flows, diagrams, an overall holistic view of how IT supported business goals, and environmental surveys that include the locations, connections, resources, and more. So why did the FFIEC create a new booklet? I think the question should be, what took them so long to create a new one? So many things have changed and occurred since 2004. We've had financial collapses due to mismanagement and theft. Thank you, Taylor Bean Whitaker and Lee Farkas. And if you didn't know, he's actually out of jail now. $3 billion in fraud losses, and he spent less time in jail than you and I will spend responding to examiner requests because of his criminal activity. Management practices have evolved along with new technology. Cybercrime, like business email compromise and ransomware, has exploded exponentially. And yet, thank you COVID for allowing me and millions of other people to participate in the evolution of working from home. And technology has obviously evolved with solutions like cloud computing, zero trust, AI and machine learning, and of course, the internet of things. And if you're a Spider-Man fan, you might know the Peter Parker principle. With great power comes great responsibility. So the FFIEC has come to the rescue and created a new booklet for us that will provide institutions with guidance on AIO and how and what they should implement. So this booklet replaces the 2004 operations booklet. The 2004 booklet had only 80 pages. This new booklet not only has new information, it's also formatted with a more modern look and feel than the old 2004 version, which actually looked like it was created in 98 though. This new AIO booklet has gone to 164 pages in length. It's more than doubled. This booklet applies to entities which are defined as depository financial institutions or regular banks, non-bank financial institutions like investment banks and insurance companies, bank holding companies, and third-party service providers who are subject to the acts on the screen. This means that this booklet applies to an awful lot of companies. And here is an actual screenshot from page six of the booklet. I didn't wanna just say this part, I wanted you to actually see it and read it so please read it as I talk about it. This booklet discusses principles and practices for IT, practices for addressing risk of IT systems, and principles to help examiners evaluate the delivery of financial products and services. 
and management of the whole shebang. Of primary importance for you to note is that this booklet does not impose requirements on financial institutions. Instead, it describes principles and practices that an examiner reviews to assess AIO functions. You also need to note that principles and practices may vary according to an entity's complexity and risk profile. And here you were hoping I was going to tell you that the booklet spells out what you must do. Sorry, the FFIC has definitively told us here that it will even more so be an examiner's opinion on what should be done based on the examiner's opinion of the entity's complexity and risk profile. Notice that there is no reference to the size of the entity here. It's just the complexity and risk profile. You can be big and simple and not have as much to implement as someone small with a lot of products, services, and technology. Time for a little wordplay fun. I want you, in your mind, to think about what words or phrases we might see in this document and how often we might see them. You ready? May have is referenced 13 times. Strategic goals is referenced 14 times. Strategic objectives, 16 times. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, 25 times. Business objectives, 26 times. Now let's jump it up a little bit. Third party is mentioned 190 times out of 164 pages. Cloud, 231 times cloud is referenced. And what's the most used word or phrase in the booklet? Management should. 291 times management should is used. You can read that as on management shoulder if you'd like, but yes, 291 times, that's an awful lot in 164 pages. So who is this management that should? That's your board of directors, the president, CEO, CFO, all of your C-suites, and any and all line of business management, such as IT managers, HR officers, loan officers, mortgage officers, and more. You've heard me say in other presentations that there should be a top-down approach to doing things. It has to come from top-level management and down for any chance to establish consistency and buy-in from all levels of the institution. To break the handbook down into sections, uh, and section one, I like to call the ABCs of AIO. It's a high-level overview of what AIO is. So section one starts with describing architecture. It is defined as how hardware and software components are designed, organized, and integrated to support business objectives. How they align with strategic goals, how they meet the needs of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and how they minimize operational and reputational risk. Infrastructure is then described and defined as the physical IT operations components needed, such as hardware, which would be firewall servers, etc., software, your operating systems, Excel, Exchange, networking components like cabling, hubs, switches, environmental components like HVAC, and your fire suppression equipment and telecommunications such as the IP phone system, any type of instant messaging application, and more. So operations is defined and described as the activities and the performance of those activities that support IT operations. Things such as the methods, processes, and procedures used, the steps that actually transform data resources into the tangible products and services, Operations delivers the value to internal and external customers. And operations also includes the maintenance, monitoring, and support of the business systems, products, and services. Section 2 covers AIO governance, the who, what, and how management oversees the should part of management should. We need to caveat this section just for a second, though. The management in AI in AIO does not supersede the IT exam booklet on management. 
This section is in addition to that booklet and only specific to AIO. So section two gives us information on the best practices of AIO governance in the areas of board and senior management responsibilities, strategic planning, enterprise risk management, other roles and responsibilities, policy standards and procedures, internal audit, independent reviews and certifications, communications, and board and senior management reporting. So here are a few items to note. First off, everything in this booklet is AIO. So board reporting and participation needs to reflect AIO references. For other roles and responsibilities, there are a few new roles defined in the AIO. Those of the chief architect, the person responsible for guess what, the architecture, and the person responsible for all of the institution's data, the chief data architect. Chances are good that someone in your institution already wears these hats, but they are unofficially wearing them. Depending on the complexity and risk in your institution, you may need to make official hats for these titles and give them to someone. And setting baseline metrics for all areas of AIO, such as performance of AIO activities, return on investment, anomalies, and areas for improvement. Now let's look at some common risk management topics that extend across all three areas. So as I just mentioned, there is overlap of risk between the three areas. You can read them on the screen. I want to point out a couple of them. Shadow IT. If you're not familiar with that term, shadow IT is the use and implementation of IT without the knowledge and permission of the IT function. The reasoning most shadow IT is in use is someone wants to solve a problem and they know that IT won't allow them to do it, so they take matters into their own hands. Some shadow IT devices commonly used are wireless access points, USB devices, and potentially remote access software, such as TeamViewer. It is important to realize and understand that you will face these risks and the plans need to be put into place to control these risks. Some other common risks are brought by BYOD, bring your own device. A lot of times, management does not have control in place to handle these risks. What does your institution do for the use of Google Drive or OneDrive? What about GitHub? What controls are in place for when an intern posts the SolarWinds password, SolarWinds123, for everyone to use? And section four discusses architecture. Five of the last six paragraphs start with management should. Management should ensure that IT architecture meets strategic and business objectives, along with the architecture's ability to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data and systems. Obviously, policies, procedures, and standards should be in place to govern the architecture design process. An architecture also includes the architecture plan, design objectives, and the actual design of the entire enterprise architecture. As discussed earlier, infrastructure is the physical elements, products, and services needed to support business activities. So an institution must ensure that the IT infrastructure meets strategic and business objectives and goals. Look familiar? Yep. Infrastructure also needs to meet the institution's needs for CIA. Again, you have your policies, procedures, and standards that are needed to be in place to safeguard and protect your facilities, data, and you, the personnel. BCP and DR for in infrastructure is included as well, as is hardware, software, network and telecommunication systems, environmental controls, and physical access controls. It all adds up to infrastructure. A note here that there is information related to closed and open source software. And finally, a little bit more on the O part of the book, operations. An entity needs to develop and implement controls for the operational environment as well. Controls for the tactical management of technology assets and the delivery of services that capture, transmit, and store information. 
It includes operational controls and processes, service and support processes, ongoing monitoring and evaluation processes. This is where the authorization boundaries are developed along with your identity access management systems, personnel or HR controls on hiring practices and controls on personally owned devices as well. And an important part of the new AIO booklet, Evolving Technologies, the stuff you see and wonder what wizardry created it. Like the wizardry of cloud computing, we'll talk more about in a few moments. Zero Trust Architecture is based on zero trust principles and is designed to prevent data breaches and limit lateral movement when a breach does occur. The more diverse the network, the more zero trust can benefit. However, financial institutions are showing hesitancy and no trust in zero trust as of yet. If you think we should do a webinar in the future on zero trust, put that into the survey at the end of the webinar. Microservices are independent building blocks used to create applications and such. Put simply, each component serves a singular function and it takes a multitude of microservices put together to make a complex function work. As such, it creates a lot of trust issues and microservices should all be treated as non-trustworthy. And then of course you have AI and machine learning. I think we're all familiar with those. And then the Internet of Things or IoT. We're only going to do a deeper dive into the top two uh, because those are currently being implemented and we're getting a lot of questions from management stakeholders that are feeling uncomfortable with those two. And so the first one is cloud computing. Half of the conversations I have during audit engagements center around cloud computing. Cloud computing has five essential characteristics. On-demand self-service where provisioning the system can occur automatically without human intervention. Broad network access, where just about any device, anywhere, can access it. Resource pooling, that's where providers' resources are pooled from multiple locations on the fly to support your demand. And rapid elasticity, that's where resources can be scaled up or down very quickly when demand requires it or even doesn't require it. And measured service. That's where your resources and allocations are set according to your utilization schedules. And there are three primary cloud computing models. SaaS, software as a service. That's where the application is running in the cloud environment including your network, server, storage, etc. The client doesn't manage the software. Then you have platform as a service. That's where the cloud service providers provide the systems for a client to run the client software. The client does not manage the hardware. And then you have infrastructure as a service. This provides both SAAS and PAAS cap capabilities for complete customization by you. And there are four primary cloud deployment models. You have public clouds, which are provisioned for open use by anyone over the internet. You can have private clouds, which are for the exclusive use of a single entity and generally owned and controlled by that entity. Community clouds are those where a specified set of users can utilize a cloud environment. And then you have the fourth one, a hybrid cloud, as it's a combination of two or more of the other three. So let's take a quick look at responsibilities and controls in the cloud environment. The booklet delves into the shared responsibilities of controls when using the various platforms. This graphic is actually from the booklet itself. You can see some of the responsibilities of the on-prem services, responsibilities dealing with infrastructure as a service, responsibilities for platform as a service and software as a service with the normal outsourcing responsibilities indicated as well. This is a great resource to help you align your institution's responsibilities appropriately. All right, that's enough about cloud computing. Let's look at the wizardry of zero trust architecture. So zero trust architecture. First, let's refer to it as ZTA. 
you might also know it as perimeterless security, where there is essentially no edge network when it comes to trusting. I'm sure you know the old examiner lingo, trust but verify. I even mentioned that at the very beginning. For ZTA, we actually changed that up a little bit. It's never trust, always verify. This means that all users, whether they are inside or outside of your financial, your financial institution, has to go through a continuous validation process to ensure that they are who they say they are. This prevents someone who has gained unauthorized access to your internal network from accessing anything else without the need to further authenticate themselves. And earlier this year, the Biden administration actually passed regulations that all government entities are required to implement ZTA. So if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us too, right? So let's talk about ZTA's basic concept, micro perimeters or micro segmentation. Terms are kind of inter interchangeable. So every device, piece of software, interface, database, everything has its own little perimeter around it. Let's use a county fair's petting zoo as an analogy. The firewall of your network is like the entrance to the petting zoo. Once you get in by going through the gate and showing your wristband, you can roam around the petting zoo freely petting any of the animals you want to. If a petting zoo implemented ZTA, once you entered through the main gate by showing your wristband, you would then find each animal surrounded by its own perimeter fencing. In order to get in and pet that animal, you would then have to show your wristband again. Then once you get inside to pet the goat, in order to get some pellets to feed that goat, you would need to show your wristband yet again. So micro perimeters, again, firewalls for every device, software, and interface. So what you see here is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's actually referred to as the Kipling method. The Kipling method is simply asking all of these questions. So ZTA actually uses the Kipling method by continuously asking the who, what, when, why, where, and how in order for you to access each device, system, et cetera. The great thing is the ZTA software handles all of this for you. So you don't need to continuously type your password 27 times within a single hour. So if you want to implement ZTA, you absolutely can, even in a financial institution. Auditors and examiners will want to look for whether it meets your business objectives and goals. They'll want to see if it went through your strategic plan or was the decision an impulse one. An impulse decision will cause the examiner to look at the decision-making and implementation process more closely. So we definitely recommend that it goes through your strategic plan. Vendor selection due diligence. Did you look at more than one solution? Did you vet your vendors and determine which product and company best suits your goals and objectives? And then we'll want to see ongoing oversight and management. We want to make sure that the project was completed successfully with no or outstanding issues, and then whether or not reports are being generated and reviewed, and statistics being reported to senior management and the board. We'll also want to know, was it in your risk assessment? And so now I know you're wondering, where's A, B, and C here? I'm starting with the last appendices and working backwards towards A, as A is what I want to end on. So with that being said, Appendix D, there are a lot of linked references in this appendix the FDIC, Federal Reserve, OCC, NCUA, and so on. Feel free when you get the booklet and review it to click on the links in the booklet. Not very often you'll hear IT security guys saying, go ahead and click on the link. Uh, go through and review the references to find out more information about each topic in the reference section. And that's right, Appendix C has a lot of abbreviations and what they stand for. It's going to take me a minute to read through all of these, so just hold tight. Uh, kidding, just joking. 
then you also have Appendix B, the glossary appendix. One thing that I think is cool is that they link to the source of the definitions that they used in the AIO booklet. Again, I recommend visiting the sources and learning more details about all of these that you see here. And Appendix A, the examination procedures. If you get nothing else out of the booklet, please review the examination procedures. This will provide more useful information to you than the rest of the booklet. If you look at review and prepare for what the examiners are looking for, you can ensure that you are ready to meet the management should aspects of your audit. And as an FYI, in 2004, in that booklet, the operations booklet, the examination procedures were 19 pages long. In the 2021 version here, the examination procedures are now 31 pages. So the appendix is designed to assist examiners. Notice the word assist. Examiners are not just limited to using the AIO booklet for conducting their examination. Examiners can use just parts of the booklet based on the size, complexity, and nature of the institution. And examiners can also use other sources as the basis for their findings too. They can use ISO, COBIT, NIST, whatever they decide is an authoritative source. So there are a total of 18 examination objectives. They're broken down into two management objectives where there are 16 determinations and findings to be found through reviewing 65 data points. There are 10 common AIO objectives with 37 determinations and findings through reviewing 221 review points. There's one infrastructure objective where there are nine determinations and findings to be filed through reviewing 140 review points. And there are four operations objectives with 20 determinations and findings to be found through reviewing 182 review points. And notice the last objective, it's not yours to do anything with, communication of findings, other than to respond to what's given to you by the examiner. So that's an awful lot of determinations, findings, and review points. 83 total determinations and findings, 608 total review points that you may be asked to provide documentation for. But note that not all will be applicable to your institution. So we don't have time to cover all of the, object, uh, all of the objectives in depth. I do wanna cover what I consider to be the most important ones, which are going to, going to be the first three. Uh, we'll start with objective one. Uh, the first objective is obviously determining scope. Why is this the most important? Because as part of objective one, the examiner starts with reviewing past reports and outstanding issues, followed by reviewing management responses to those issues. So repeat outstanding issues are red flags for auditors and that will set the tone for the entire audit. You don't want the auditor or examiner thinking that your institution doesn't take the findings seriously enough to rectify the issues that were found. While an examiner's job is to remain objective, this gives them more than enough reason to look harder and deeper than they might look otherwise. You don't want them to do that. No one wants them to do that. The best way an institution can smooth the audit process is by making sure outstanding issues have been corrected and having the documentation already ready for the examiner, not just for the outstanding issues, but if an advanced request list, if they list out 83 determinations and 608 review points that they can give you, you don't have to give it all to them, but if you can give them what they want quickly, it certainly boosts an examiner's confidence in the soundness and safety of your institution. So for your future reviews, look for the examiners, auditors, or assessors to utilize these examination procedures in their findings. And as always, this booklet is implemented and reviews and findings can be updated and released. We'll know more about how the regulators will implement this booklet over the course of the next year. 
So objective number two is management governance. This one is really the biggest focus of examiners to ensure that management is doing what they are supposed to do for oversight of the AIO areas. So first, examiners will look at whether there is a management process in place to govern AIO. Examiners will also re review management and board oversight, which should include, as I mentioned earlier, AIO-specific references within the various reports being presented to management. Examiners will look for assigned responsibilities, and they will be reviewed for appropriateness to ensure that the right people are assigned the right responsibilities while maintaining separation of duties. And of course, we all know that policy standards and procedures are going to be reviewed. But again, you want to ensure that AIO-specific references are going to be incorporated into them as well. Your independent reviews will pretty much stay the same, but again, not to beat uh, you know, a dead phrase, the AIO-specific references will need to be included here too. And finally, examiners will want to look and see if specific AIO-relevant information is being communicated appropriately and effectively to your staff. And the last objective we're going to cover in depth is objective three, that management understands the common risk and mitigating controls related to data governance and data management. So they're going to look at, does management classify data? Examiners are going to review the data destruction methodology and does it work appropriately? They already do that now. Do the controls in place promote the confidentiality, integrity, and, available, and availability of the data? And what database controls and management are in place and whether or not they are effective? And interestingly enough, examiners are going to review what data analytics you're using, what's in place, and what's being used for management reporting and supporting decisions made by the management. Objective four, we're gonna quickly cover the rest of the objectives. Objective four covers your IT asset management, which we know is not just inventory, but end of life tracking as well. Objective five covers how management documents the IT environment, such as your network diagrams and data flows. Objective six handles your IT change management and not just the actual changes, but a adaptability to your changing environments as well. Objective seven is focusing more and more intently on third party and vendor management. We all know because of solar winds and some of the other breaches that have occurred, third party and vendor management has expanded. Objective eight handles the resiliency of your institution to recover from incidents such as ransomware, et cetera, as well as resiliency being covered in the contracts you have with the third parties. Section nine covers remote access for all of your AIO components and the ability to maintain security, protect the processes, and employ proper risk mitigation techniques. Objective 10 handles the BYOD, management considerations for AIO from due diligence and the types of devices that can be safely used and ensuring that you have the proper infrastructure in place to support it. Making sure that you have policies and other controls for mitigation and enforcement of your BYOD devices. Objective 11 covers, quote, file exchange systems, share file, OneDrive, SharePoint, anything that can facilitate exchanging files from one person to another is gonna be covered by objective 11. Objective 12 wants to ensure that management of architecture aligns with the stated business goals and objectives and takes into consideration future state. In other words, what it might look like down the road a year or two from now. 13 wants to ensure that management is using infrastructure to support your data confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This covers your SIM, your SIEM, your IDS, IPS, your intrusion devices, 
network performance, HVAC and environmental controls, and more. 14, covers management's implementation of operational controls or the responsibilities as it relates to facilities, boundary protections, identity access management, and your door controls, and those type of solutions. Objective 15, reviews what management has implemented operationally, process-wise, to minimize failures and downtime. This covers preventive maintenance, your maintenance windows, ensuring that work on systems occurs outside of business times, and detailed logging of any systems issues. Number 16 covers what has been implemented for support and service processes, such as help desk and ticket tracking, SLAs, your service level agreements, OLAs, and more. Number 17 looks at management of processes to monitor IT operations and reporting of controls monitoring, your KPI monitoring, and more to the appropriate management teams. And 18, this one is for the examiners to discuss and communicate findings along with discussing corrective actions and recommendations. However, while 18 is for the examiner or auditor, you can use and should use 18 to your advantage. There are a few ways that you can do so. You want to discuss if the applicability of the finding should apply to the size and complexity of your institution. Remember, this is up to the discretion of the examiner and his or her team. You can and should make case representations as to whether or not something should apply to you. So feel free to talk back and forth with them. You want to discuss with the examiner what they believe are the root causes of the findings. Use this time to discuss potential solutions, but know going in that examiners will not recommend a specific product, but they can recommend a control or methodology. And can you or they provide examples where these processes, where their recommendations actually worked. And lastly, you want to verify that the chosen solution will satisfy the examiner. So, hey, examiner, we want to implement this, and these are the controls that will be in place. Will this satisfy your findings? So, ensure that you're using Objective 18 to your advantage, because again, while it, as it reads, it's strictly for the examiner, it can be utilized by you to help during your exams. And so let's take a look at some conclusions and takeaways. What's old is still there. A lot of that information is being reused in the new book. They just added a lot more to it. Evolving technology has been reviewed since 2004. There are 18 objectives, 83 determinations and findings, and 608 review points in this booklet. And unfortunately, again, there are no definitive must-dos or must-haves. What you should implement is based on the size and complexity of your institution. Management should is the primary focus. And examiners are free to use part or all of the booklet. Your examiners can use other resources too. There are a lot of different areas that your examiners can pull from to conduct your exam. So let me turn it back over to Amanda and let's see if we have any questions that we can answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vaughn. Um, we did get a few questions that rolled in throughout the presentation. So to start us off, someone did ask if the slides will be sent over. And yes, they will be sent over to you in an email. Um, the second question, other than what we provide in this booklet, how do examiners formulate their opinions on what or what doesn't apply? That's a great question. Uh, examiners end up having certifications like the CISA, they, they're certified information security auditors, that type of thing, but they also go to banking webinars. Uh, some of the FDIC examiners actually hold meetings throughout the year 
where examiners can go and auditors can go and review what the latest hot topics are and the interpretations that the FDIC or FFIEC examiners will go by. So while they do have a lot of discretion, their opinions are really being driven by some of the deeper, uh, higher level entities. So that's a great question. Hopefully that answered that. Awesome. And we did get one more. Um, how long should it take us to implement the additional things in this booklet, such as updating policies to reflect the AIO verbiage? Oh, another good question. And uh, I think here you're going to find that the interpretation is going to be up to your examiners as to how quickly that should be. Now, as far as your policies go, you have a general annual uh, update and review and approval of those policies. And so they're going to look to, to ensure that you've placed that verbiage in them for your next approval cycle. So they may not require you to have it today, but through the next approval cycle, if that verbiage is not in there, then they will probably present a finding to that effect. Uh, so realistically, you would have roughly 12 months to implement a lot of the information that's in here. Again, the majority of it you're already implementing. There are just some updates. So hopefully that addressed that question. Were there any more, Amanda? Yes. Um, are the examiners already using this booklet or are they transitioning to it and still using the old booklet somewhat? The examiners that I have spoken with have transitioned already to the new booklet. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some leeway because, you know, one of the key points throughout this whole booklet is examiners may. So it's going to really use that number 18 that we talked about a few minutes ago to work through any questions or findings that your examiner might have if they're using the new booklet. But again, even if they're not, use number 18 even for the old booklet examiners. That's a great question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vaughn. That concludes our Q&A and wraps up our seminar. InfoSite wants to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, and we hope that you enjoyed this seminar and learned something new. We will be sending a follow-up email with all the resources, so be on the lookout for that. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact either of us using the contact information provided or by responding to our follow-up email once you receive that. As stated before, our post-show survey will pop up in a minute, and we really appreciate all of your feedback. We hope that you have a great rest of the day and we will see you next time. Thank you.